Hi everyone, in this video we're going to briefly explore whether teaching is inherently a political act. It is one of the most controversial topics in the field. There are laws getting passed about it in state legislatures, and the answer really depends upon your uh, supposition and ideology that you take. Remember, we've studied different ideologies already previously in this course. Social efficiency essentialism, um, perennialism, critical theory. Uh, we've studied a little bit about pragmatism and each of these different ideologies that you find yourself in alignment with will provide you with different answers as we're about to see. First of all, let's look at perennialism. Uh, perennialism is a traditionalist approach to the curriculum. We draw on what are identified as traditional ideas uh, dating back to the Greeks and to the Romans, focus on education that has and these great ideas that have lasted over the centuries. There is a concept on focusing on the core subject areas, English language arts, science, mathematics, uh, development of students' intellectual and moral qualities. There is an emphasis on shared foundational knowledge um, that is necessary to participate in the wider culture. Um, Edie Hirsch is one of the leading proponents out of the University of Virginia, one of the leading proponents of a concept called cultural literacy, which is in line with the perennialist school of thought. This is the idea that there is a core common knowledge uh, that goes into reading comprehension, critical thinking, problem solving that all students need to share. Um, critical literacy is based upon the idea that you don't just need to focus on, let's say, decoding skills, you also need to focus on building background knowledge. Now, controversially, in the late 1980s, um, Hirsch was uh, creating a, uh, a sort of co concept of cultural literacy that also identified lists of common books that we needed to, uh, to read as students and these lists of books were critiqued about whether they were diverse enough um, and so this is a controversial concept. I've included an interview uh, with Edie Hirsch uh, that I would like you to read. I've tried to give you different viewpoints in here because one thing I want you to know very, very clearly is that I don't want you to think that I'm promoting you to, in order to get a good grade in this class, that you have to identify with one of these ideologies or another. I want you to become familiar with the debates. I want you to become familiar with the thoughts behind these debates and to be able to think um, critically and informed of, um, about these debates that you're going to see shaping curriculum and shaping your own curriculum. Next, we're going to look a little bit at essentialism, social efficiency. Now, like I've said before, um, I view essentialism as the driving force in K through 12, pre-K through 12 schools even, as well as higher education because of the, um, by law, uh, the force of high stakes testing, quality assurance measures, even when you look at professional learning communities that are being promoted. The professional learning communities, P, uh, PLC movement that we'll look at um, in other uh, courses, uh, other classes, including later on in this course, uh, the PLC movement is very much tied into the quality assurance movement. Um, and so you really can't understand the K through 12 schools without also understanding essentialism and social efficiency. Now understand here um, that when we talk about essentialism and social efficiency, there's a strong emphasis on objectives, on objective learning. The teacher is basically a manager. So someone who identifies as an essentialist would argue, keep politics out of the classroom. Um, that if a teacher is in any way, shape or form um, political, or if students can even identify what that teacher's politics are, even on social media for that matter to take things to um, a fairly extreme uh, then that teacher has failed by contrast if we look back at perennialism what you see is with Edie Hirsch there's a fairly clear 
um, ideology and politics by Edie Hirsch. Now Hirsch is, and other perennialists may be critical of the far end of the spectrum, which is social mediaism, uh, which is very overtly political um, and overtly uh, drawing on critical theories, we'll see later. So they're very critical of that school of thought and also critical of uh, John Dewey. Um, but there's a, the, the critical theory line of thought would argue that if you look at Hirsch's, the implication of Hirsch's a curriculum. If you say that certain books are to be encouraged as core knowledge, well, who gets to determine that core knowledge, right? Um, who gets to determine which books are cultural literacy and which books do not qualify is what we need to read as an aspect of, of critical literacy. So Hirsch might argue that we need that the social miliarists are going too far in terms of politics and uh, political teaching, but the social miliarists would argue back that Hirsch's um, curriculum design and approach to curriculum is inherently political too. Uh, so you can see the debate that goes on. Um, likewise with social efficiency, the very aspect of the fact that what's on a test um, is by definition um, shaping what we teach because you can't really, if when you've got high stakes tests that shape whether a student passes from one grade to another and what a graded school is and the reputation of a district, the reputation of a state, clearly these high stakes tests shape curriculum. And so uh, the debates, whether we want to admit it or not, the debates over curriculum and standards of curriculum tend to get fairly political, um, whether we want to admit it or not, but the ideology of essentialism. Um, an essentialist advocate tends to argue that we ought not to be political in the classroom. Critics of essentialism would argue that essentialism is political. So you see the back and forth here that takes place. Essentialism basically draws on the following attributes. It is very utilitarian um, in its approach. Schools should focus on what students concretely need in their lives and what the nation needs. So identify what students are likely to need in their professions and focus on those specific skills. Identify what the nation needs in order to be competitive and focus on that specific stuff. Essentialism leans toward behaviorism in its learning theory. Um, and you'll see that other approaches tend to lean on other learning theories. Uh, there's a very high um, emphasis on what's measurable, what's data-driven, uh, task analysis, quality assurance uh, movements uh, within behaviorism and within essentialism. The objectives are basically tied to accountability movements that we see with No Child Left Behind and the Every Student Succeeds Act. The teacher is basically a manager of the condition of, of learning. Um, and really, the teacher relies on outside experts to determine what the curriculum really ought to be and then implements that curriculum. Some um, proponents of and foundational thinkers within the essentialist line of thought, Franklin Bobbitt, who's fairly um, foundational in the field of curriculum theory. Uh, Franklin Bobbitt emphasized scientific techniques drawn from business management and industry. Franklin Bobbitt studied what for him at the time, 1913, was the fairly new uh, techniques of industry, including a mass production with Henry Ford, and wanted to draw that into uh, making schooling more efficiency. So the child is viewed as basically equivalent to raw material that is shaped um, into eventually a finished product as an adult teacher basically is a manager, a factory, a manager working in a factory um, by analogy with Franklin Bobbitt. Uh, the curriculum is what takes place to process, process this child, the child being a raw material, into becoming um, an adult in society. Uh, the curriculum is developed by scholars, researchers, experts who determine what is needed and then the teacher implements that. Uh, so the curriculum basically uh, consists of a set of tasks 
that are needed to be completed in order to process this child into a desirable product. Each, each task is analyzed using a task analysis to find the most efficient way of implementing that. So oftentimes you would see a flowchart of these tasks that are need, needed to be completed within the curriculum. Drawing on Bobbitt, you, you also later would find Ralph Tyler um, and his influential book, Basic Principles of Curriculum Instruction, was also extremely foundational in the field of curriculum theory. And you still see um, basically what we might call Tylerism um, shaping curriculum to this day. And when you look at state standards, when you look at the lesson plans you expected to produce as teachers, it's basically Tylerism in a nutshell. Uh, so the curriculum consists of a sequence set of learning experiences, um, each representing behaviors that the students ought to complete. Um, you are supposed to identify certain goals and objectives and educational purposes are supposed to help ensure that students meet these goals and objectives. Backward design that we're going to be looking at in this class is very much drawn on Tylerism. Uh, you're supposed to identify certain experiences that uh, will ensure that students meet goals and objectives. And it's supposed to be a very efficient thing. Um, you plan in advance and you plan very specific um, behaviors uh, that will ensure that students meet learning and behavioral goals. And you assess whether these are being met or not and you adjust your instruction accordingly. If that sounds very much like the language you hear to this day, it is. And uh, essentialism very much draws on uh, what we can call behavioral engineering. It's, it is very behavioristic. So it's the obtaining of educational purposes, analysis take place trying to identify a sequence of desirable specific behavioral objectives basically respond stimuli that sort of thing um, and you uh, figure out what's the hierarchy what's the step-by-step -step linear process of activities that will ensure that goals are met as well as what tools, what uh, material is needed, and what assessment is needed uh, to see whether the learning gains are being met or not. Um, now, like I said, with essentialism, you're really looking at um, proponents of essentialism, like Tyler Bobbitt would say that the teacher has no place bringing politics in the classroom, absolutely none. But critics of essentialism would argue that um, the very aspect of delineating curriculum in this way is a political act, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. Okay, so next we get to progressivism, uh, sometimes called pragmatism, uh, drawing uh, very strongly on the writings of John Dewey, um, Montessori, and Lepagoski are also um, thought of as, as this. And progressivism, pragmatism, when we look at learning theories is strongly associated with um, aesthetic approach as well as to constructivism. So within this approach, students are thought of as learning best from what they consider to be very relevant in their lives. Um, it's very much focused on the needs, identifying and working with the needs, the interests of students. It's very much of a sol problem solving, project based, learning based of approach. Um, and education should be a process that is very much ongoing and focusing on growth of the student. And all of this now, whether progressivism is political or not, to the, uh, to the central core of this question, you will find, because there is no one single uh, progressive approach, you will find different approaches to pragmatism, some that are more overtly political than others. Um, I think the life of Dewey, John Dewey, is a good example. Um, in his earlier writings, uh, dating back to 1896, Democracy and Education. Um, you, Yes, you definitely find politics in his writings as he's talking about what it means to, to, uh, to be a democratic society, but he wasn't so much calling on a change uh, 
and a radical reformation in society. He was talking about how can we ensure that students are reflective thinkers um, in order to productively participate in society. Now, as Dewey got older, and especially as he looked at some of the pain that took place in society in the 1930s with the Great Depression, uh, John Dewey became increasingly socialist and he became increasingly aligned with what we can call the social militarist um, school of thought. Um, and so you see where I'm coming from in terms of if you are a progressivist in your approach, you're not necessarily social militarist, but there tends to be um, an alignment uh, between the two um, in terms of whether education is political or not. Um, the later John Dewey would absolutely uh, say that education is a political act um, in a more ch change agent sense. Classrooms are often thought of as many workshops, as laboratories where students learn and participate. Um, and again, we want to identify the needs and interests of students and work within the context of those needs and interests of students. And there's an understanding that um, education is very much within a social context. Contrast that with behaviorism, which tends to separate from the social context and identify the best practices to uh, operate to reach learning goals that are best practices universally, regardless of whether you're talking about X cultural group or uh, poverty versus um, uh, versus wealth and etc. So you can see the difference there, too, um, in terms of whether there is politics or not involved. Social constructivism is strongly associated with pragmatism and progressivism, as we're going to see. So uh, again, with this, you're looking at development occurring um, as people participate in human activities and activity is key and understanding these activities in the context of these activities is key to understanding how learning takes place and many social constructivists would argue that as part of understanding human activities the political context of these activities is part of the ecosystem, to use a term drawn from Bronfenbrenner. Uh, Dewey, Montessori, and Vygotsky um, are strongly tied uh, with social constructivism. Now, Vygotsky um, is an interesting little case uh, because Vygotsky is normally associated as a constructivist and normally when we talk about Vygotsky in educational classes as well as in professional development once you become a practicing teacher we talk about the ZPD zone of proximal development which is that distance between uh, what a child can do independently and what a child can do with assistance and you're supposed to scaffold guide provide tools to help that student reach eventually um, expertise and independence in increasingly advanced skills. As the um, old saying goes, what a child can do with assistance today, even um, tomorrow, metaphorically tomorrow, the child can do independently. But there'll always be a shifting ZPD because now you want to um, guide the child toward other more advanced skills. Uh, so, and you can talk about the ZPD uh, without going into politics. And normally, um, discussion of Vygotsky is divorced from discussion of politics. Now that being said, Vygotsky himself was anything but apolitical. Um, Vygotsky um, was deeply influenced by the writings of Karl Marx um, and other um, Marxist um, theories uh, such as um, Hegel. Uh, who, who in turn influenced Marx, uh, GWF Hegel. And um, so Vygotsky himself was overtly um, trying to create what he called a Marxist psychology uh, in which you take into account um, uh, 
power versus lack of power between, let's say, teacher and student and social classes that exist, um, and where you take into account op uh, the oppressor vis-a-vis -vis the, the one who is oppressed in society and in cultural classes and how that operates in educational contexts. Um, and we tend to identify Vygotsky as a social constructive. So here we get into um, the interplay uh, between social constructivism traditionally and what we'll look at as social ameliorism. Um, it, it's not as neatly separated and divided as it often um, is discussed. Um, for Vygotsky and other social constructivists, language as well as culture are tools as well as context. Language is thought of as a tool, culture is thought of as a context uh, through which humans experience the world, communicate, understand reality, and learning takes place. Uh, and so uh, the classroom is intended to be a community of learners where students work together, collaborate, teacher and students work together and collaborate uh, to create new knowledge, ideas, and skills. And to be very bottom line about this, it is possible to be a social constructivist and use social constructivist strategies in the classroom without being overtly political. It very much is possible and many teachers do it. Um, so you don't necessarily have to be overtly political, um, at least intentionally overtly political, in order to use also constructivist tools. Um, but at the same time, uh, bear in mind that the more you get into this philosophy, uh, Dewey and Vygotsky especially uh, would argue that there is a political context to what you are doing, whether you want to consciously admit it or not. Now, humanism is an interesting thing. Humanism is, I'm wanting you to understand humanism as something that is separate from, let's say, constructivism and perennialism and all that stuff. Um, as I've said before in a prior discussion, um, humanism, I see it as interwoven in the schools, regardless of what other ideologies uh, we tend to look at. Um, humanism draws on the writings of Carl Rogers and especially Abraham Maslow. There is an emphasis on development of the whole child, emphasis on understanding how children grow and develop over the lifespan and adjusting your curriculum accordingly. Um, this developmental trajectory of education Under, um, encourage students to understand the self, understand their own motivation, self-inquiry, um, and student goals are of particular interest. Now notice here, even though um, the language and the approaches of humanism, I would argue, have become very deeply influenced in PK through 12 schools, there is an inherent contradiction here uh, between uh, the humanistic psychology of, let's say, Rogers and Maslow and the behavioristic psychology of Skinner. Uh, for instance, that is very influential on Tyler and Bobbitt and the foundational scholars behind essentialism. Um, and so it, that's an interesting little thing that we see because essentialism and humanism have become extremely, extremely um, influential in schools. They both have. And yet there's a kind of push-pull philosophically and in terms of the learning theory um, between humanism and essentialism because for a behaviorist, um, learning is context independent. We can understand best practices of instruction independent of needing to study the various contexts. Um, for instance, let's take reading instruction. Best practice for, the, for an essentialist, a behaviorist, and when we get into the science of reading um, approach, the best practices of teaching, um, let's say decoding and phonics, uh, for instance, um, the proponents of this would look at Orton Gillingham type approaches, etc. Um, the best practices, their best practices for all um, across schools, 
um, regardless of what context and neighborhood you're talking about, and regardless of what the needs and interests of the child will work, these are the best practices. Boom, period. Um, and a humanist would say, and a constructivist would also say, not so fast. Let's look at the context. Let's look at the needs and interests. Things can vary. Are we so sure about one-size-fits-all approaches? So there is the contradictions here. Um, now, would a humanist agree that education is an inherently political act? I would say it varies based upon the branch of behavior of humanism that we're talking about because there are differing branches out there. Um, if you can read Abraham Maslow and look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs without necessarily seeing it as political. There's nothing overtly political about this hierarchy of needs, the meaning of physiology, physiological needs, safety and security, love and belonging, esteem, and eventually reaching self-actualization. But the argument back from the social leaders would say is that how can we look at the social context of how these various needs are met without looking at the political context? So you can see again the push and the pull here um, within education and within these debates that take place. So within a humanist curriculum, there's a strong emphasis on the following. Learning should be self-directed for the students. Schools should produce students who want to learn and know the processes of how to learn. They learn very strategically. Um, there is a strong emphasis on self-evaluation so that students know how to evaluate their own progress, how to identify their own knowledge, and how they are progressing. They can analyze for themselves. Um, the aesthetic approach to education, feelings and sensory experiences are a very important part of the learning process. Um, and there is a strong emphasis on the uh, classroom learning environment being non-threatening. You can see how that again, even though humanism and social essentialism and essentialism are both extremely influential in schools today, um, there's a little bit of a contradiction here because when we look at high stakes testing, I would not call high stakes testing non-threatening. <laughs> and so you can see the push pull here. Finally, let's look at social meliorism. Social meliorism is the most overt um, political uh, form of education. Teachers who identify as social meliorists um, very overtly and unapologetically say, yes, teaching is a political act. When you see authors, um, whether it's in a textbook that you read um, or an article, journal article that you read, and you see an author or authors say teaching is inherently political, you know that that author um, is very strongly influenced by social meliorism in that author's approach. And there's nothing wrong with identifying where an ideology and stance um, comes from in an author. Um, I'm not so sure that we can identify a scholar that's 100% objective. All scholars are influenced by one of these ideologies that we're talking about, um, or perhaps others that we're um, kind of skipping over. So, uh, for instance, like I've said before, I'm not going into great detail about post-structuralism and post-modernism. Post that We don't really have that time for that in this course, unfortunately. Um, but that being said, if we're going to look at um, understanding the textbooks that you read, there is something to be said for recognizing, okay, here's where, here's where these authors are coming from. Likewise with me, I try to be very, very open about where I stand. And that's one reason why I encourage you to read some of my articles. And I do include some of my published work traditionally in um, my classes, not just simply because, ooh, look at what I've done, but it's also because I like the idea of my students knowing where I'm coming from. Um, I like the idea of you being able to identify, okay, here's where Dr. Kearns comes from, 
let me keep that in mind in my learning and my uh, from him you may or may not agree with some of the um, uh, some of the conclusions that I've reached and that's okay but you deserve to know where some of my foundations come from and we we'll call it a bias if you will call it uh, call it an ideology but you deserve to know where they are so a social meteorist uh, seeks a social change and views a teacher as a change agent in society um, and this is associated with uh, things such as social justice as well as critical theory a little bit of an introduction here we've talked about critical theory before we'll talk about it in greater detail as we move further into this course uh, critical theory um, is generally associated with the writings of Karl Marx, although there are multiple forms of critical theories out there that have been developed over time. Um, it's largely associated with the Frankfurt School out of Germany. That's a long story. Um, but traditionally, critical theorists and Marxists uh, see the educational system as a uh, working in the interest of the ruling class and part of the rule, a role of the teacher is to identify uh, the way uh, that the educational system writ, writ large is set up to benefit the ruling classes and therefore to oppress um, the non-ruling classes um, and the minorities in society and the less fortunate in society and to work against that oppression to stand against that oppression, um, understand where inequalities, um, class and gender and race and ethnicity based inequalities and inequities are set up um, to be supported by the system um, and stand against that, and uh, which can be risky for the job, frankly. It's, it's a little bit dangerous to your career. Uh, to be a social meliorist, especially if you are in a um, school that favors either perennialism and or essentialism, uh, and you're likely to work in a school that does. Um, so you're you're taking a little bit of a risk to your career if you're a very strong critical theory social meteorist in your stance. I'm not saying not to do it. I'm just saying to recognize um, recognize the reality of the situation. And feel free to look at a video that I've attached by um, Henry Giraud out of McMaster University in Canada. Um, he's very much identified with an approach called critical pedagogy, uh, which draws on Marxism um, he's uh, some of you may or may not like what he has to say some of you might might really dislike what he has to say because he's a critic of capitalism um, and so but some of you might like what he has to say but I want you to be familiar with these various different schools of thought whether you agree with them or not <laughs> 